Hey team, Andre from High Performance Academy here. Welcome along to another one of our webinars. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a topic that uh, I know confuses a lot of people, throttle body sizing. What size throttle body is right for your application? And as we go through, you're actually going to find that that's not uh, an answer that we can easily give a black and white number for. But we're going to dive into the considerations around it and uh, look at some of the mistakes, more importantly, that people make. Particularly, I see so many people try and go for a throttle body that's way bigger than they need, giving no performance advantages and actually creating a whole bunch of headaches along the way. So again, we'll dive into that uh, in a moment once we get into our actual web. Uh, before that, uh, a few things that have been going on over the last few weeks since our last webinar and we are running another one of our giveaways so we'll head across to my laptop screen for just a moment here. Uh, there's nine days left for this giveaway and we have partnered with uh, our clothing brand Ernest here so it's going to be the perfect uh, giveaway for anyone who actually likes to get their hands dirty working on cars in the weekends or after work and uh, chances are if you're anything like me you've probably ruined and a few uh, pretty good t-shirts along the way getting grease and other stuff onto a t-shirt that you probably shouldn't have been wearing in the first place. Uh, it's all easy in hindsight but of course uh, a set of overalls are probably the perfect solution here. So we've got our set of our Ernest Harden overalls. Uh, we're also including a Squire Workshop apron. So uh, these are our fabrication aprons. You can use them for just about anything. How you can bake a cake with them if you prefer but a good thing is regardless whether you are fabricating a roll cage or baking a cake you're going to have plenty of pockets for all of the stuff that you need to keep close to you. Most importantly as well, got that pocket for the cell phone to go in because let's be honest, what's the point in stacking dimes if you can't snap a few pictures and punch those up onto your Instagram? No point really at all. We're also including the Ernest Tasker K Canvas Pants. Uh, these are made out of, out of our own special K Canvas which has a Kevlar uh, weave in with the cotton. So it makes it a lot stronger than a conventional cotton. Uh, these pants actually have a CE rating for those of you who are into riding motorcycles so a bit of added safety if you do happen to come off your bike. Uh, those pants are a little bit more hard wearing than your average denim. We are also including the K Canvas Smith jacket as well which is the perfect accompaniment to the, uh, the pants and uh, they actually look pretty smart if you're heading out on the town as well. Uh, also include an HPA and an Ernest Stay T plus you're going to get a full HPA VIP membership so total package value there is in excess of two and a half thousand US dollars you can get your name into the draw on the page I'm on here and uh, Scott will drop a link into the comments that you can follow to get your own entry and there's a few other tasks you can do to get yourself a few more entries there as well and nine days left we'll ship this anywhere in the world so it doesn't matter whereabouts you personally are, we'll ship it straight to your door free of charge. Now uh, in terms of other news around here, really excited to announce that we have got a brand new course out there in the wild so that is our CAN Communication Decoded course. So for those of you who have been long time HPA followers, uh, you may remember Zach who was our wiring tutor, uh, Zach worked for us for about 12 months and he worked for us a couple of years ago unfortunately he got poached off us by a local university however uh, we have kept in touch and we had the opportunity to collaborate on another course which is this CAN communication course. Uh, this is something that is really important if you're dealing with late model factory cars or for that matter pretty much any late model electronics. Uh, so CAN is a universal communication protocol that's used by both OEs and aftermarket electronics manufacturers. So understanding it's pretty important on a number of different levels. First of all if you are setting up something like an aftermarket dash logger, the one I've got here is a Motec C125 but just about any of the current crop of dash loggers out there will take in data via CAN. Uh, so if you want to be able to set one of these up and receive information correctly, understanding CAN and how it works is really, really important. Uh, you can also receive data directly from the factory CAN bus on a stock car, 
But of course there's a lot of information floating around on that CAN bus and understanding how to find the particular parameter that you're interested in and then decode it into something that we can actually display on the likes of a dash or maybe in our ECU. Uh, that's a, another challenge altogether. Uh, it's been very difficult to find information on how to do that. There's a couple of other CAN enabled devices here. Uh, I've got this CAN keypad. This particular one is sold and used with ECU Master uh, products, their, their ECUs and and their power management units. However, this keypad is actually a universal keypad. It's not manufactured by ECU Master. So you will see it used by a range of different manufacturers, just like uh, Motec have adopted the Greyhill keypad. Exactly the same sort of thing. They're not making it. It's just a CAN-based keypad. Nice thing about CAN, if you don't actually understand what it is, is that it is very simple. It simplifies our wiring dramatically. So this little keypad here that has uh, eight buttons on it, each with multiple functions as well. You can see on the back of it, we've actually only got four wires coming off this. We've got 12 volts and ground, which actually provides power understandably to the keypad. But all of the data transmitted from this keypad to whatever wants to utilize that data comes over a two wire bus, and that is the CAN bus. Now, the great thing there as well is that keypad can then be connected to the same bus that has all of our CAN enabled electronics on it, maybe a dash logger, uh, maybe an ECU, maybe a power distribution module. So that same key press can be used by multiple devices. So it's very flexible in that way. You've got all of that data, very easy to communicate communicate large amounts of data between different devices. Uh, another product here that I'll just point out as well and uh, maybe I'll just get this one under our overhead for a second and again uh, those who have been following us for a while will probably already be familiar with this. Uh, this little guy here on the back of the steering wheel for our GT86 this is an ECU Master CAN switch pad so uh, a lot of people want to add uh, buttons and switches to their steering wheels and uh, generally it gets pretty ugly because you've got to end up sending all of that data through a curly cord and when you need two wires for each of your buttons and potentially three wires for each of your uh, ro rotary multi-position switches that gets pretty busy uh, pretty quickly so in this we've got down two three four five six buttons uh, so those are just a an on off style button and we've got two uh, rotary knobs here one for traction control and one for boost we turn this over all of this comes into our can switch pad and then out of that again we've just got our four wires as I mentioned before 12 volts ground can high and can low and again that information is available anywhere on the bus for any other devices to use it so that's kind of a really quick and dirty understanding of what uh, can is and why it's important to us in the aftermarket uh, but if we jump across to my laptop screen for a moment uh, this is uh, just a bit of a rundown on that CAN course. Uh, so I'll give you a uh, link that you can go to in a moment that you can actually find out a little bit more information about it. Uh, but uh, with Zach's university background, he actually got pretty deep into CAN. He actually did some decoding uh, as a university project for, it's not actually CAN, but uh, Toyota used a variant of, of CAN uh, on the likes of their 3SGE beams engine to uh, get data up to the dash. And he she decoded all of that and that was subsequently used in uh, Lynx uh, plug and play ECU for the Alteza. Uh, so if you scroll down the uh, course is available for 199 US dollars. Uh, you can use our payment plan as usual breaking that down into eight uh, interest free payments of just under $25 uh, a week. Uh, so if you use that payment plan as well I should mention you get instant access to all of the course material you don't have to wait eight weeks to start learning. So I just want to go over a little bit of the course curriculum here. Uh, so obviously can if you haven't come into this before and you're completely fresh to it which is absolutely fine there is no uh, prerequisite before you take this course you don't have to have ever dealt with can before of course teaches you everything you need to know but uh, that really starts here with this required uh, technical background theory uh, where we start getting into some things that are maybe a little bit uh, unique for those who haven't dealt with programming before such as binary decimal and hexadecimal uh, bits and bytes big Indian and little Indian very important here, Indian, 
not Indian. Very big difference there, but you'll find out what all of that means. And this is the background information that you will need to understand in order to get a little bit deeper into CAN, which is where we move into our CAN specific technical theory. So you'll learn what a CAN bus is, uh, what the bus actually consists of, so the physical implementation of the CAN wiring. And this is important because if we don't have the bus constructed and designed properly, then you're likely to introduce errors and problems with communication. So it does have to be quite specific, it has to be a twisted pair of wires, we do need termination resistors at each end of that bus and there is also limitations on how far the different communicating and receiving devices can be located from that central bus. This gets a little bit more complicated because a lot of the the products that we will be dealing with uh, may not have a software configurable terminating resistor so if they've got one built in this can determine whereabouts on the bus they need to be located. We'll talk about the electrical signalling transmission speed as well is really important. There are a variety of different speeds or board rates that uh, can buses operate at so it's important imperative that uh, you are communicating at the right but bus speed otherwise you're going to introduce problems and we'll talk about the message structure so how a CAN message is actually made up and understanding this again really important to basically the whole process of uh, building up a CAN communication template or decoding factory CAN messages. Uh, we'll talk about the different CAN protocols as well that you're going to come across. Uh, then we'll talk about some of the practical aspects such as simple versus compound CAN messages, how those are made up what the identifiers are. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, CAN message frequency and bus load. Uh, so there is a limitation here on how much uh, information can be transmitted across the bus. And if we go too far, you know, over about 80% uh, bus load, you're likely to start getting problems with reliability. Uh, we'll talk about the common interfacing and debugging tools as well as how to tap into an existing CAN bus to actually get that information out. Uh, then how to determine whereabouts you'll find messages. So this is one of the parts of reverse engineering which can be a little bit daunting, particularly if you connect to a factory late model ECU CAN bus and you're looking at scrolling data coming through from that looks a little bit like you're uh, trying to look into the matrix and trying to find a specific piece of information in that initially can seem uh, like trying to find a needle in a haystack so I'll show you how to go about that. Uh, determining parameter scaling as well is really important because obviously we've got a raw hexadecimal number that is being transmitted between devices uh, but if we are for example transmitting wheel speed or coolant temperature uh, we're interested in uh, uh, applying a scaling so we actually get a number that we can make use of so uh, the scaling is really important to understand there. Uh, we'll carry on down a, a little bit further we've got uh, two five step processes, processes here as well once you've got a basic understanding of everything I've just gone through. Uh, we've got two processes depending on the task you're trying to complete this first one that I've just highlighted here is our CAN bus network setup five step process. So this is if you are setting up communication between different devices and a lot of people will be doing this uh, when you are installing aftermarket components, aftermarket electronics in your race car or any car for that matter and uh, making sure that those devices are communicating the required parameters backwards and forwards accurately is really important. So we'll teach you a step by step process on how to do that. Uh, then probably the bit I get asked about more often though is how to reverse engineer a factory CAN mechanism. So we've got a five step process for doing this as well. So basically that's what I was talking about, looking at all of the information coming across the CAN bus, highlighting the particular piece of information you are interested in and then decoding that so it actually makes sense. So we'll teach you how to do that. Now once you've gone through the course we do include a library of worked examples as well. So we've got three worked examples in that library right now that Zach's produced and we've got a few more coming up. So we've got a, an example of setting up uh, communications between an aftermarket ECU and an aftermarket dash. I've got another one of reverse engineering the output from this uh, particular can a keypad so you can see how that goes goes about and then uh, how to re reverse engineer uh, some OEM information included in there uh, as reverse engineering the steering angle position in a Toyota GT86 but re realistically irrespective of what you're personally interested in learning about uh, that course will teach you the process that you can apply so regardless what you're reverse engineering yourself what car it is remembering that can is a 
protocol. It's a universal protocol. So uh, you can reverse engineer anything using that course. So remember uh, that package, that course, I should say there, 199 US dollars or 25 US dollars a week for eight weeks. And you can find that by heading to hpacademy.com forward slash courses and you'll find that course down the bottom of our courses page. Uh, in terms of course content, I should, should also mention here that uh, this course, just like all of our courses, once you purchase it, uh, it will give you also three months of uh, free access to our gold membership. So this gives you forum support as well. So uh, if you've got any questions on the course or you get stuck into your own Kang uh, template setup and maybe you get a little bit stuck, then Zach's in there to give you some support and hold your hand along the way as well. Uh, in terms of other course content, I am currently in the middle of filming our CAM tuning course. CAN and CAM is starting to get a little bit confusing. Uh, camshaft control tuning course, just to be super clear here. Uh, so this course we've been asked for for a fairly long time now. We've done a few webinars covering some of the basics, but we thought uh, we'd try and put everything together in one all-encompassing course. So this will be perfect for those of you who are wanting to learn a process you can apply to tuning continuously variable CAM control engines very common these days, but also more simple switched cam control engines. So where the camshaft will switch between two uh, extremes, full advance and full retard. Uh, this will also apply to VTEC style switched cam systems as well, where we have a low cam and a, a low RPM and a high RPM cam profile. Uh, it will also be perfectly suitable for those who are tuning a conventional fixed cam engine that has vernier adjustable cam gears fitted to it. So we're going to cover all of those processes uh, in particular with the continuously variable cam control system uh, two aspects that are really key to this one is properly setting up the PID control algorithm so that the ECU can actually track your cam target accurately and achieve what you're asking for and if we don't do this right basically the whole system is going to be flawed and we don't have much chance of it working as well as it as it could do so we'll teach you how to do that it's actually daunting for a lot of people I know but uh, as you go through the course you'll see it's actually really really easy to do this for a cam control engine uh, because we can set up step tests where we move the cam target uh, very quickly repeatedly backwards and forwards and we can change the control algorithms and really optimize that and you can really see it coming together right in front of your eyes while you are on the dyno and actually moving the cam targets backwards and forwards. I'll also I know the other aspect that's a little bit daunting for people is well, how do we go about this process because tuning cam targets can be quite challenging. Uh, we've got a bit of an iterative process where as we change the cam target this will affect the engine's volumetric efficiency which in turn means that it will affect the requirements required fueling which also can affect the required ignition timing so we do go backwards and forwards sort of in a bit of a circle there uh, changing all of those three parameters and then going back and repeating this gets a little bit more complex again when we have a, a dual variable cam control engine where the intake and the exhaust cam timing are both variable because they both sort of affect each other so what I'm getting at here Optimal intake cam timing will actually depend on the exhaust cam timing and vice versa. But we break this all down, make it really nice and easy to understand and give you some uh, some really clear dyno demonstrations with a process you can apply to your own tuning. Uh, that course, as I've said, I'm still in the middle of filming that, so we're still a little way off, but uh, we're hoping to get that out before the end of the first quarter uh, of this year. Uh, now on to other things, uh, for those who have been following our YouTube channel, our video release this week, uh, last week, last week I think it was, uh, this is an AE86 Toyota endurance car build, uh, which is pretty rare in and of itself, the AE86, a bit of a cult classic, uh, we don't see too many genuine AE86s out and about, uh, they are generally AE85s that have been rebadged, this one is a genuine AE86 and it's been a, a race car for around about 30 years, so we talked to uh, Ryan from Team Higney Racing, who is the driver and builder of this car, about uh, what's involved and it's got some quite unusual technology in it. Uh, key to this is a 500 horsepower uh, 3SGE beams engine and this is a very, uh, Ryan was a very early adopter of the 3SGE back when they first came out and I remember when they were released in the Japanese domestic market uh, Toyota Alteza. 
Uh, they were uh, kind of right at the forefront of naturally aspirated engine performance at the time. And I know that uh, I was really interested in doing an engine conversion, but the uh, $10,000 price tag for uh, one from a local wrecker was just a little bit too steep for me. Obviously these days a lot more uh, readily available, but uh, still despite the technology being a little dated now, uh, a really good base for a build there. So we'll go into everything that is included in that car. Head across to our YouTube channel if you want to check that out. While you're there, make sure you subscribe subscribe if you enjoyed that video give us a thumbs up and if you've got any questions on it uh, please ask those in the comments and we'll do our best to get back to you there. Uh, lastly for today as well I just wanted to um, bring up one of the Instagrams we put up last week and this is a little bit dated now there's been a few changes to this car but this one really clearly illustrates uh, the application here of a drive-by wire throttle body that is mounted on the turbo compressor outlet this is actually on the jet racing uh, Mitsubishi Eclipse I think at the time I took this photo which was at World Time Attack a few years back uh, this held the record for the fastest and quickest four-cylinder drag car don't quote me on that, uh, you can fact check that, this, these titles sort of tend to be traded backwards and forwards pretty regularly but uh, suffice to say uh, it's at or very close to the top of the four cylinder drag racing world records uh, with an engine that produces somewhere in the vicinity of about 2000 horsepower. It's actually since gone to a compound turbo setup but uh, one of the problems with trying to make such high horsepower levels with a single turbo and a small capacity engine is we run the engine very very dangerously close to the surge limit. Now generally because the engine's operating in this case between about 9.5 and, and about 11,000 RPM as it goes down the drag strip, uh, we can kind of get away with this. It's, normally it's going to be close to the surge limit but it's, it's workable. Where drag racing can get a little bit tricky though is when the car's on a poorly prepared strip, maybe it's not quite got as much grip and if the car gets a little bit loose, a technique that can be used to tame the car down rather than lifting off the throttle is to actually short shift into a higher gear. So that reduces the engine torque and can reinstate grip. The problem with this with a clutchless gearbox where the driver doesn't need to use the clutch or lift off the throttle to change gear is it drags the engine RPM down further in the rev range uh, but the boost pressure really stays exactly the same the, the, the turbo doesn't drop off boost like we would see with a conventional uh, manual transmission and it's that combination of lower RPM where the engine's volumetric efficiency is lower coupled with the uh, airflow from the turbo at high boost that can tip it over the edge and push it into surge which can be uh, pretty ugly and can actually be quite destructive particularly at very high boost levels so uh, the way jet racing got around this or uh, tried to get around this, it was pretty effective, was to instigate this little drive-by wire throttle body. This is controlled with some custom firmware in their Motec M1 ECU and the idea here is uh, under those conditions where uh, the turbo is deemed to be uh, pushing beyond the surge limit, the throttle body can just be cracked open a little bit, uh, allow a little bit of air to be bypassed and uh, basically moving the turbocharger out of surge. Uh, this can actually also be used as a boost control strategy when the car is on the two-step launch limit as well uh, which can give more stable and consistent boost pressure than using the wastegate to control boost particularly with these clutch cars where they use a slider style drag racing clutch it's really critical in order to get consistency on the launch from that clutch to make sure that the engine is always leaving the line at exactly the same RPM and at exactly the same boost pressure if we vary the RPM that will affect the centrifugal uh, weights on the clutch and how much clamp loading that's provided Likewise if the boost pressure is higher or lower uh, then that will affect the amount of power that the engine has when the, the clutch is released and again the result will be different uh, in terms of the way the clutch responds so really important on those clutch style drag cars. Alrighty, uh, just one more time remembering the earnest giveaway we've got going there, only 9 days left so please make sure you get your name into the draw, we'd love to kit you out in some earnest gear and give you that HPA VIP membership, it'll give you free access to that brand new CAN course, uh, our upcoming CAM tuning course and every other course we ever release in the future, you'll never pay a cent for another course, so 2500 US dollars worth of value so jump on that and get your name into the draw. Alright, give me a moment here and uh, we'll get started with today's webinar. If you liked that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. 
click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.